Welcome to the Belly Button Window Channel and Episode 20 Part 1 of the Jimi Hendrix Story, like you've never heard it before. In this episode, we begin the deep dive into March of 1968 and the group's continuing US tour. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video information page, where you will find links to related videos, performances, and stunning photographs from the period. Mitch on the US tour. Wherever you were, it was always watch your step time, but some places were better than others. San Francisco was never a problem. Los Angeles was variable, especially when the authorities had the curfew on the kids. New York was fine in terms of the police. It was just cabs and hotels that were a problem. In Texas, we always knew we'd have fun, but anywhere else was potentially threatening. While according to Noel, running parallel to the on-the-road confusion was the business drama. The management was doing good business with several touring and recording bands. Among the London, New York and Nassau branches of the operation worked ranks of lawyers and accountants, supervising a vast income derived from many sources. In spite of all the LP advances and tour earnings for the experience, an audit resulting from the PPX Capital Records litigation showed that Mike Jeffrey's account was overdrawn by $27,000. March 1st, 1968 and the experience flies from Milwaukee Airport to Newark, New Jersey, then on to New York, where the group moved into the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. While that evening, Noel Redding joined Robert Wyatt and Roger Mayer, and together they spent the evening with Jimmy at the Scene Club in New York City. March 2nd sees the experience do a live radio interview at the Real Rock Station, New York, followed by two shows at Hunter College, New York City, supported by John Hammond Jr. and Soft Machine. Set list for the first show was as follows. Tax-free, Foxy Lady, Like a Rolling Stone, Killing Floor, Red House, Manic Depression, and Wild Thing. According to Tom Lucas, In 1968, I was an amateur photographer and rock music-loving high school student in New York City. I saw, spoke to, and photographed Jimi Hendrix for the first time backstage at Hunter College. He rescued me and a few other teens from getting busted by the New York City cops. He refused to go on stage until the police released us. Our crime was trying to sneak into the show. In an excerpt from issue 67 of the Univibes magazine, Tom detailed the encounter. While Jimmy and his entourage were heading from their makeshift dressing room to the stage, he happened to pass the room where we were being held. He stopped and asked the cop something. Then he, Noel and Mitch came in and in a soft, calm voice told us not to worry. Jimmy explained that he was not going on stage until everything was straightened out. We were all in shock. Here he was holding his Gibson Flying V and actually talking to some serious teenage Hendrix fans as if they were equals. If it were not for the fact that I had a camera and documented this event, I myself would have found it hard to believe. Variety Magazine Concert Review Many rock and roll concerts these days, while drawing blockbuster response, are handicapped by a theatrical amateurism that undermines any customer return potential. Viewers of the Jimi Hendrix Experience concert at Hunter College, New York, Saturday night, were assaulted by cacophonic bullet sprays of sound. To be sure, the noise made a lasting impression, but in the process, it laid all the cards on the line to spell out why so many rock stars must base their success on the hit-and-run concept. Hendrix's noise was greeted by two standing-room-only houses in the 2,200-seat auditorium for an estimated $18,500 gross at $4.50 a pop, Sound on sound they go, go go and where the rockers will stop, nobody knows as long as youngsters keep shelling out top coin for fourth class showmanship. East Village, other interview by Jules Freeman. In less than a year, Jimi Hendrix has become myth. The Black Elvis come to grind the squirming white hoppers into mush. Oh yes, Jimmy won't do you no harm. But to watch the audience explode into frustrated little girl screams at Hendrix's electric frying show at Hunter College last weekend was to see a myth being born. The East Village. Other asks. I'm just curious as to whether these are songs you've written over a period of time, or whether you just go into the studio. Hendrix replies, A lot of them are ideas I've had from the village, some of them, like we just got around to recording Little Wing. East Village Other asks, No, you do a lot of cording on the bass. Now your bass lines are funny. I'm used to either a standard walking jazz bass or country and western one-third or a Chicago blues riffing thing. Some of the things on the album were complicated four, four time over. Reading answers. I like doing that. Changing time. Mitchell adds. There you go. We don't think about time. 
If you want to be technically specific about it, wow. The bass player's and drummer's roles are almost completely reversed. The drummer isn't the anchor. The bass is more of an anchor. But you've both got freedom whatever you're doing. Hendrix. As far as technical works of timing or trying to blow somebody's mind with a strange time. Mitchell. You know, we're not doing this thing. Wow, we can play a number in 19 to 8 or whatever it is. So, what? Big deal. Like Dave Brubeck. Who cares? You know, you become aware of your time and forget all about it. Who wants to count time for the rest of your life? Hendrix continues, Yeah, but our music is like that jar of candy over there. Everything's all mixed up, regardless of what the scene might be. You don't put yourself in categories or else you find yourself really unhappy, because then you might want to do something else. The best way to accept some of the things that we do, if it's all that important, is to take every song for what it has to offer instead of trying to put it all in one big thing, because our next LP is going to be completely different and, you know, strange. Someone from The Move sang background on You Got Me Floating, with Noel and Mitch and our manager's footprints can be heard on the fade-out of If Six Was Nine. Hendrix comments that the piccolo sound on Axis, Bold As Love, was actually a Moroccan flute he bought for two shillings. You can get that same sound out of a guitar. We've got a gadget called the Octavia that we use on a song called One Rainy Wish. It boosts the guitar twice as high. As far as guitar, in terms of electronic gadgets... We use repeat echo, wah-wah, things like that. Jimmy used a hand wah-wah on Are You Experienced. Both Hendrix and Cream used the first wah-wah foot pedal at the same time. On Spanish Castle Magic, we used a guitar, bass and drums and piano, and a lot of things are in unison. Noel uses an eight-string bass, plus I was playing the same thing on guitar. It didn't come out as clear as we wanted, but it was a hint of what we're trying to do. Rat Subterranean News Review by P. Dingle this Saturday night, Hunter College concert was like an abbreviated chronology of the rock and roll scene. A little typical old rock, a little typical new rock and much too little a typical Jimi Hendrix rock, which combines the best of the old and the best of the new, with great talent and a unique original sound. With three extra guitars lined up on the floor, Jimi Hendrix strode on stage and took over the hearts, souls and heads of the Hunter College audience. Their first song, Let Me Stand Next to Your Fire punctuated by some pointed tongue and pelvic action by Hendrix, set most of the female and much of the male audience screaming, and when a tormented cry for Foxy Lady pierced the air, Hendrix only nodded and whispered into the microphone, Yes, I understand, baby. By Hey Joe. The experience had created a growing emotional orgy, as Hendrix played almost exclusively with one hand, his forearm, or his teeth. Then, the experience tore into Foxy Lady, and the audience went nuts. Hendrix slammed his guitar back and forth against the microphone. Mitch beat the shit out of his drums. And fleet-fingered Noel Redding, bass man Indian, stomped around the stage and dug his amplifier. The second concert closed with Purple Haze, complete with its three-minute super-spaced introduction, and Hendrix playing the guitar between his legs. The great thing about the Jimi Hendrix experience is that it can be reproduced, live, before your eyes and ears. Under all the electronic equipment is the music of three... Count them, three fantastic musicians who need only plug in to get the full effect of what can't usually be done even in multi-million dollar sound studios. The sad thing about the Jimi Hendrix experience is that it was much too short and that the shouts for more were ignored. But there's one more thing to be said. Although the experience was short, it was complete. Not one girl left the Hunter College Auditorium a virgin. March 3rd saw the experience travel from New York to Ohio. Neville Chester's road manager for the band, noted in his diary. Drove 474 miles from New Jersey to Ohio and encountered snowstorm after Pittsburgh and a multi-car pile up along the way. Later, the group performs at the Veterans Memorial Auditorium in Columbus, supported by Dante's. Four o'clock ballroom and the soft machine. March 4th, 5 and 6, Mitch and Noel head to the Bahamas. According to Mitch, we actually managed to get three days off so I flew to the Bahamas with a girlfriend. Noel joined us, which was odd because he really doesn't like sunshine beyond the odd hour lying by the pool. He gave it all of three hours, whereupon he decided he hated the Bahamas and flew straight back again. While Noel has the following take, Mike Jeffrey acted like a member of the Nassau Tourist Board, talking up all the opportunities awaiting a sharp investor. What did I want with a piece of unoccupied Caribbean land? Jeffrey made it sound like heaven, so Mitch and I relented and flew down to have a look. Heaven, it wasn't. 
One look at us and the hotel lost our reservations, and we were shunted off to $100 a day rooms in another hostelry designed to separate the tourist from his money as quickly as possible. The weather was relaxing, but we were constantly hassled by idiots about our long hair. Nassau, the heat was nice, but in the long run a sauna would have been better. It was nonetheless a welcome break from touring. March 4th, and Frank Simpson interviews Jimmy for Melody Maker, published March 16th, 1968. The following is an excerpt. He's relaxing in his hotel room in New York after being thrown out of his first hotel. Must have thought I was an Indian, he says. He's tired, says so and should be. I want to think about some sessions we're doing in New York. They're not in my mind right now, but I've got to think about them. Buddy Miles dropped in to see him, talked about jamming. Both Buddy and Jimmy want to get out and jam in a club for the evening. The first thing Jimmy did, arriving in New York and finding that Eric Clapton was there, was arranged to jam with him. You can do this in New York, he explains. Neville Chester's Travel diary. We got up at 12. We tried to book a room, but the hotel manager told us it was full. Liars. So we booked a room at the Holiday Inn. We packed our bags and then we took a taxi to get there. After checking in, I took a taxi to the airport. I took the van that Hugh had left for us and drove it into town. I visited a radio store and bought a Motorola. Great. I tried to install it, but it was getting dark, so I went back to the hotel. I washed up and then went down to the restaurant for a great meal. I watched TV for a few hours and went to bed at midnight. Crushed. Later that evening, Jimmy jams at the scene club. Some sources claim that Jimmy and Eric Clapton played together on this date, but this appears to be incorrect. Clapton was at Winterland in San Francisco and was on the bill for several consecutive dates during this period. So it seems unlikely that he was in New York between March 4th to 6th, 1968. Tuesday the 5th of March, 1968. Neville Chester's noted in his travel diary. Return to New York by car. 474 miles. We got up at 9 a.m. for breakfast. We got dressed. Returned to the radio store for instructions on mounting the radio. It worked well. We were leaving for New York and I wasn't feeling well. We left Columbus at two o'clock and drove to Wheeling. We walked around for half an hour, then left. We didn't stop until New York except to get gas. We drove through Ohio, Pennsylvania to take the New York Ferry Turnpike. We arrived in New York at the scene at 12.30, not bad. We stayed at club for two hours, but nothing was happening. Back to the hotel, checked in then to bed, very tired. Wednesday the 6th of March. Mitchell and Redding fly from the Bahamas to New York. Later that evening, Noel goes to the scene club, where Soft Machine is performing. After their set, Jimmy participates in jam sessions with different musicians, including with the band The Hollies. Noel Redding recalled, I showed up at the scene that night and met The Hollies. Jimmy's there, I want to jam also, but he doesn't want me to. Thursday, 7th of March, and at 10.15am, Jimi Hendrix appeared at the New York offices of the Halperin, Morris, Grenet and Cowan Law Firm where he was questioned for approximately three and a half hours during a preliminary hearing regarding the pending legal proceedings of the PPX company. Parties to the legal action are as follows. Jimi Hendrix and Yamata Co. Limited are the plaintiffs. Defendants are Capital Records, PPX Enterprises, Edward Chalpin and Curtis Knight. Henry W. Steingarten of Steingarten, Wedding and Weiss are the plaintiff's attorneys. While Elliot Hoffman represents PPX Enterprises, Chalpin's company and Solomon Grinette, represents Capitol Records, the label on which the album Get That Feeling was released in December 1967. Later that evening, Jimi Hendrix and Jim Morrison jammed together at the scene club while Janis Joplin looked on. Listening to the recording, one can hear that Jim Morrison is mainly in the background screaming like a drunkard, but there are some cool moments. One is Hendrix covering the Beatles, Tomorrow Never Knows, and Cream's Sunshine of Your Love, not to mention Elmore James and Morrison himself. Another is when Jimmy acknowledges Morrison as the guy yelling. It's a bit muddled, but it's an interesting piece of rock history. According to some accounts, the evening disintegrated into a chaotic brawl that ended with Joplin smashing a bottle on Morrison's head. The full set list? Red House, Bleeding Heart, Woke Up This Morning and Found Myself Dead, Morrison's Lament, Tomorrow Never Knows, Uranus Rock, Outside Woman Blues, and Sunshine of Your Love. That concludes this installment of the series. Stay tuned for the next installment, where we will continue the deep dive into March of 1968 of the Hendrix story and the band's US tour. Don't forget to subscribe for future content updates. And by the way,
If you have any stories or anecdotes to contribute, we would love to hear from you.